Peter and Kiram and Chiraka. This is chapter 20, that being lesson 18 of L.W. De Lawrence's The Master Key, published, I believe, in 1914. Thought Control. What thought control can do for you? Control your thoughts, that you control your world. Mr. Dickinson had just finished his breakfast, which he has thoroughly enjoyed. He takes up his newspaper for a quiet 15 minutes perusal. Suddenly he notes that a client has gone smash. In consequence, the satisfaction brought by his good breakfast vanishes, and he goes to business in an unhappy frame of mind. Robinson had not enjoyed his breakfast, and has not been cooked to his satisfaction. He opens his newspaper morosely and suddenly notes that wheat has gone up two points. Woo! In consequence, he forgets his badly prepared breakfast and goes to business in a happy frame of mind. A tourist on a long walking tour is delighted with the fine weather he is having. The farmers in the districts the, through which he is touring are in despair because of the long drought and its effect on their crops. Well, what can we learn from the above cases? We can learn this. The world for each of us is what we think it. There is a correspondence between the things we see, hear, touch, taste, and smell. But we look at them from different standpoints. From our own standpoint. The world, for each of us, is, or we might say, is our world. It is what we think it is. Every day, millions of men, women, and children look out each morning on their world. To some it is a glad world, a beautiful world, a happy world. To others it is a sorrowful world, an ugly world, a miserable world. It is such a world because they think it is so. Now, you can alter the character of your world. Can you? Let's just ask that first. Can you alter the character of your world? Or must you always accept and interpret it in the same way? You need not, you ought not, unless it is the right way. For just as your thoughts make the world a miserable world to you, so can your thought transform it into a happy world for you. Well, how is this to be done? And the reply is, by learning to control your thoughts. The fear thought need not always make you afraid. The anger thought need not always make you angry. <clears throat> control your thoughts and you control your world. It is the object here, one of, the, one, of the, one of the objects here in this playlist, Personal Evolution Part 3, to teach you the secret of thought control and mental discipline. It's one of our aims. Thought can turn a brave person into a timid one, a strong one into a weak one, a cheerful person into a sad one. A proud, domineering person into a humble, abject, and cringing one. Thought can change the character of respiration, can impede or assist digestion, can alter the quantity of the secretions of the body, can induce many diseases, or banish many diseases. It can induce nausea and even death. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thought can fill us with hope, or plunge us into despair. It can fill us with inspiration, or crush all initiative. 
It can make us persevere against many odds or raise up difficulties to bar our every step. Your thoughts can make you or unmake you. Your thoughts can do this. In fact, are doing this. Will you not have a say in the matter? Will you not see to it that only good thoughts, brave thoughts, inspiring thoughts, hopeful thoughts, cheerful thoughts shall form what we call your world? <clears throat> You can do this. Encourage such thoughts to dwell with you. Cast out of your world every thought that tends to rob you of your peace of mind and your hope of success. Excuse me. You can do this. For it's mainly a matter of trying. Oh, one thing for sure. Doubt about this will bar the way. Your thought atmosphere. You would not consider a consumptive person to be wise if you went to live where it's always damp and cold, would you? You would feel constrained to tell him to seek a climate where it's always warm and sunny. Well, you must take the same medicine. If you are to make any advancement in life, you must live in a congenial atmosphere. It must be an atmosphere of thought, faith, and belief that will help you to develop by stimulating all your energies, all your faculties. It may be that you are in a business or a line of life for which you feel unsuited, let's say. Well, is this a congenial atmosphere? It is not if you feel it and if you think it unsuited for you. It can be if you will alter the character of your thought world. Many people live an unreal life in such circumstances. While at their business they, may, they, they seem bright, cheerful, and industrious. It's only when the day's work is over, when the glamour of excitement and hurry is past, that they catch a glimpse of their real world. And that's when the regrets the cares, the disappointments come forth from the slumbering background. These people are now surrounded by their real atmosphere. It is usual in such cases to offer the advice, well, get out of your present business, or whatever the case may be. Get into a new line of life. Now, this is, in the majority of cases, well near impossible if it has to be done in a single leap. No. The best advice to such a person is to rid, to get rid of this inner thought world, the world of regrets, cares, and disappointments. Consider, what good do such thoughts bring you? None. None. What good do such thoughts bring you? None. So why cherish them? Why hug them to your breast as a miser hugs his gold? Now we're not going to offer you cheap advice like be brave, persevere. Endeavor to persevere. No. We're going to put the matter fair and square to you. The message right here about thought control to you is this. By living in this inner atmosphere of regrets, quick cares, and, excuse me, disappointments, you are not advancing one iota toward the life you seek. Excuse me again. 
you are tending to put that life beyond your reach. By changing your thought world, you tend to make the life you seek possible. <clears throat> you can even make it current. The current one. You must cultivate the attitude. Well, I'm in this line of life here, this business, so to speak, and I'm going to make it the stepping stone to my real career. I'm not going to allow it to fill me with despair. I'm going to master its secrets. I'm going to live in hopes of the real thing turning up. And I'll add, perhaps in mastering its secrets, we'll find some of the real thing right there. I'm going to be cheerful. I'm going to be hopeful. Persevering. I'm going to win in spite of all odds. And again, I'm going to add the note. And sometimes, with that thought atmosphere in place, we find that we're already winning, in spite of all odds. When a man gets into an atmosphere like this, he feels it to be congenial. Very often, too, such an attitude results in the man feeling his interest in his present business grow to such an extent that it ceases to be distasteful. New points of view reveal possibilities in the business that he thought he never thought to exist. He sees vistas of further possibilities until the life he hankered for sinks further and further into the background. He is at home. He has found himself. His thought world is congenial. Mental attitude. If you were to ask a friend, what do twice two and a half make? He would probably hesitate before replying. <laughs> if you were to add to your question, now be careful how you reply, his hesitancy would be even more pronounced. Question is stated in that above manner. What do twice two and a half make? Now be careful before you answer. Well, questions stated like that and all kinds of conundrums. Uh, questions stated in the above manner um, have all kinds of conundrums and catches and, and, and things like that. Illustrate that we approach a subject with a certain mental attitude. Tell a man a thing is difficult, and you make it difficult for him. Tell him it's easy, and you make it easier for him. <clears throat> Much, of course, depends upon your manner, as shown above, in making your statements. In approaching any new study, or, any, or in, a undertaking, in undertaking any new task, it's well to understand your mental attitude beforehand, If you think the study or undertaking difficult, you will certainly make it more difficult. For when we think anything difficult, we put a, we put a bar on our power that greatly hinders progress. Cases are on record where new systems of working have been introduced into offices, systems with a certain amount of complexity, and the clerks have made slow progress with them simply because they offered something strange, something difficult. Weeks have elapsed before the staff thoroughly grasped the system. And instances are related where members of a staff have become ill from worry 
in their efforts to grapple with new conditions. Perhaps this sounds a bit familiar to you. Well, note this. Where it has been necessary to engage temporary help, it has been noticed that they have mastered the system in a much shorter time than the permanent help. Why? Simply because the temporary help approached the work with a different mental attitude. They knew nothing of the relational difficulty between the old and the new system. They saw the work had to be done in a certain way, and they quickly mastered that way of doing it. This is very much the same as when you hire new people, when new people are brought into a situation. It's often considered advisable to bring in people who have no experience with that line of work at all. Unless it's something, you know, where a lot of experience is required just to understand the basics or a good deal of education plus experience is, is a requirement or, or no new outside help is going to understand anything at all about it. <clears throat> So this is just, you know, this applies to general cases. Uh, sometimes, you know, let's say skilled labor. If new people are desired, new employees are needed, the staff needs to be enlarged, it's sometimes desirable to bring in people who have no experience with this line of work at all and start them at the bottom because they can be trained in that particular business's way of doing things more quickly or more easily, let's say, than somebody coming in with experience from other businesses that do it other ways. Such individuals, in the latter case, may have a more difficult time because of their mental attitude toward this company's, this, this company's now um, ways of going about the same labor. Switching over. A professor of music was very strict with regard to his pupil's mental attitude. He would never allow a pupil to play a solo or study. He would never allow to say, a pupil to say, a solo or study was difficult. He would make the pupil point out the difficult passage, and he would carefully analyze it note by note until he made the pupil play it. He would tell the pupil not to worry because, there goes my cat panther running around, knocking things over. I have to keep the right mental atmosphere about that cat. <laughs> you see, it's hard to keep a clean house here, to keep everything orderly, because I have two cats. Puma, he doesn't disturb anything. Panther, though, a little half-sized thing. See, if I maintain the thought group, the set of thoughts that involve the idea that my house needs to be orderly, then I can't be happy unless it is. Well, I'm living in the wrong house. <laughs> well, I should change my house, right? I mean, I should go live somewhere. I should get rid of the cat. Right? Get rid of that cat. <laughs> oh, but then that brings up regrets and other stuff. Well, 
or I can change my thought atmosphere, which is what I do. You know. Panther, come here. Come here, baby. Meet the peoples. Come say hi to the peoples. This is the little panther. This is the panther. Look at that squirrely thing. Anyway, we both live here. She doesn't pay rent, but she's like a roommate, you know? And we both live here. And I have to, I provide the home. I provide the home. And we, we live here. So she messes things up, and that's okay. I have to, I deal with that. You know, I live with it. It's fine. It's fine. As a matter of fact, I don't have to go around sorting everything out all the time and straightening back up. It's, who wants to do that all the time? It's not required that everything be right where, you know, where, where I think it should be. It's not required. I don't have to think that everything has to be in a certain spot. Small little thing, you know. Small mental adjustment. Change of thought atmosphere. I mean, the cat lives here. So do I. It's just the way it is right now. <clears throat> well, this music professor would tell the people not to worry because you couldn't play the he, he would tell the people not to worry because he could not play the passage up to time he said that will come with practice he would say that's what he would say and, and he said it in such a confident tone that his people believed him and was, and was inspired to practice until success crowned the effort Teachers have often noticed that when a number of their pupils have failed to do answer a, a question, a verbal question, the power of the other pe of the other scholars was to reply had been slight. They look on the question as a sort of a conundrum, which it's hopeless to answer, and they therefore give up the attempt. Two students will enter an examination room. One will rapidly glance at his paper and put it down disgusted. It's difficult. The other will read each question carefully and calmly and will finally conclude the paper to be possible. Which student is likely to pass? Every student of thought control and mental discipline will realize that it is important while recognizing the difficulty of a subject to put this thought out of the mind at once. Speaking of students, every student of thought control and mental discipline will realize that it is important, while recognizing the difficulty of a subject, to put this thought out of the mind at once. Refuse to acknowledge its difficulty, and you will make the subject easier for you to grasp. Excuse me. Mustache hairs. Get to being a little tickly. The fact is, very few exert anything like po the power or ability that they possess. They are like the traveler who suddenly finds a high wall closing his path. I can never get over that. I have to turn around now. Well, as he turns to retrace his steps, he sees a bull or a wild animal coming tearing along toward him. <laughs> he alters his tone now. I must get over that wall, he says. He makes a desperate attempt and succeeds in getting over the wall. Or, <laughs> I guess, I'll just stand here. Or, we don't hear about what really happened. Because he's <laughs> ripped up. So, if, he made it, if we hear the story, that means he made it over the wall. 
If you, if you wish to succeed in anything, remember that no effort is ever lost. Every act, every attempt is registered in the neural paths of the brain at least. And each successive act or attempt will deepen and broaden those paths. Given greater facility each time. Giving greater facility each time. You may not be able to see this for a time any more than a musician can tell the finer gradations of tone which no human ear can detect. But if you persevere, you will find that that facility will come. And what's the part played by imagination? A butcher, while hanging up a heavy piece of meat, slipped and the hook pierced his arm. He was in terrible agony and could barely suffer himself to be touched. Yet when the arm was examined, it was found uninjured, the hook having only pierced his coat sleeve. <laughs> Such is the power of imagination. Such is the power of thought. Every student of thought control should understand the part played by imagination. And once he recognizes this, he will be on his guard and will test his experiences in the light of this knowledge. Cases are on record where people present, uh, present at the exhumation of a body have become seriously ill as soon as the coffin was exposed. They have felt the odor of decomposition. Yet when the coffin has been opened, it has been found empty. Or perhaps filled with stones, soil, etc. People have been bitten by dogs, which everybody declared it to be rabid, and they've afterwards died with all the symptoms of <clears throat> excuse me hydrophobia excuse me yet afterwards when the dogs have been examined they've been found free from any traces of rabies we need not multiply examples you will doubtless bring to memory many such cases yourself you will remember how you have been awakened in the middle of the night your bedroom door has been left ajar, and now you see it open gradually until your hair stands on end with fright. In such cases, if you will only remember that imagination tricks all of us, you will at once assume a critical attitude. Has the door really opened further? You watch closely. And as the critical attitude grows, your fear grows less. And finally, you get up and examine the door to find that it has not altered its position one inch. The following illustrates the critical attitude. One night, a young lady was awakened by a mysterious tapping at her bedroom window. Was it the proverbial raven? She looked in the dim light towards the window and distinctly saw outlined a ladder placed against the stonework at the top of the window. Instantly she thought of burglars. She could hear them with their instruments attempting to raise the window. A minute or two elapsed and no burglar appeared. And then she adopted the critical attitude. The result was this. The ladder was the tapes of the Venetian blind which had been left partially open. The tapping was a creeper growing on the outside of the house, which the wind every now and then dashed against the window. <laughs> now, if you will remember in all such cases to adopt a critical attitude, you will find that your fears will grow less. 
and then you will control your thoughts instead of being controlled by them. And then you will control your thoughts instead of being controlled by them. Confusion of thought. What about that? A young man bought two eggs with the intention of giving them to his landlady to boil for his supper. Nice landlady. He arrived at his lodgings. Arrived at his lodgings, he threw the bag containing the eggs on the table with disastrous results to the eggs. <laughs> you have here an illustration of thought confusion through two thoughts being uppermost in consciousness. The young man intended to take the eggs out of the bag and then throw the bag away. The throwing was the stronger idea. <laughs> or impulse, let's say. And the eggs suffered in consequence. Common illustrations of the same confusion of thought are first, that of looking at your watch and yet not, <laughs> not being able to give the time. <laughs> Second, the man who puts his watch in the pan and holds the egg in his hand. <laughs> Third, asking a question and not knowing what you've asked. And fourth, locking a door and not knowing afterwards whether you've really locked it. Study is people, business people, anyone who thinks deeply is liable to make mistakes like these. Well, this tendency can be cured to a great extent by cultivating awareness <laughs> when doing anything. Attention. To this end, you must pay attention to all of your acts. We've talked about this quite a lot, and we've done work toward this end. Well, toward these ends here, these, these simple everyday ends, and greater ends. You must have a definite aim. Where have we in this playlist Personal Evolution Part 3, done it considerably deep work with respect to aims. List of motivating goals. How many things that list of motivating goals and your continued work with it every day accomplish how many levels of activity does that draw into play many many levels of effects many areas of accomplishment You must have a definite aim and carry it out quickly and quietly. You must have orderly habits and, as far as possible, set times for doing things. Excuse me. Orderly habits and, as far as possible, set times for doing things. Nothing is so beneficial, however, for avoiding confusion of thought of the above type, the aforementioned type, as learning to do all your actions quickly and quietly. Dress quickly, walk quickly, read quickly, think quickly, get through your business quickly. You will find such practice you will find such practice leads to great clearness of thinking and precision in all that you do. And to do so with attention on what you are doing 
building these habits to in into each other so that they are all part of the same thing your action You already have been doing many, many training uh, techniques and employing them here in this, in this playlist for, for these kinds of things to be coming together for you. Any new thing that comes along here in this kind of cognitive information that's kind of like a prescription as well, any new things that you can work into or just bear in mind in your in your daily practice and your daily implementations into the rigors of everyday life add them in but what's remember always of utmost importance when going through this kind of cognitive material this kind of just information about affairs it's not going to do you much good if you simply listen to it and feel a quick inspiration or a little bit of an aha, okay, yeah, that's another point of view that makes sense to me. It's not going to do you much good. What you can do with it is get the essence out of it and make it yours right now. How? We've talked about this many times. Pay attention. To what's going on right here right now in this video if you're doing something else while listening to this video then stop listening to this video or stop doing the something else in other words focus your attention and your activity on this video, the content, the, what I'm saying right now, I'm looking into the camera, I am speaking, my hands are right here, I am not doing something else. My attention is on what I'm saying. Your attention ought to be on what you're hearing. Deeply consider as you hear it the meaning of each word. This may mean, this, this requires you to be in a relaxed state. You know how to do that now, given all things that have come before in this playlist, Personal Evolution Part 3. You know by now that whenever you listen to one of these videos here in this playlist, you need to place your attention on it. You know these things, so you will have recalled a motive. You have you will have willed to gain stronger willpower, stronger use of willpower. You will have entered into the relaxed state. You will have regularized rhythmicity, made rhythmical your breathing. You will have summoned the mood of calm confidence. You will have willed your attention to focus as finely as possible on the meaning of each word to the point of feeling them. It's not just a matter of listening to the words, hearing the words. It's not just a matter of that. The attention is on the meaning of each word. Is that what you're doing? Focus on the meaning of each word to the point of feeling it.
and to do nothing else. Think of nothing else. If some other thought comes in, what do you do? If you get an intruding thought, what do you do? Easily focus back on the meaning of each word to the point of feeling it. Oh, there came another thought. What do you do? Easily focus back on the meaning of each word to the point of feeling it. Nothing is so beneficial, however, for avoiding confusion of thought of the above type as learning to do all your actions quickly and quietly. You will find such practice leads to great clearness of thinking and precision in all that you do. Now, what about the effect of fatigue on thought control? When you are tired, either by mental or by physical work, you will find it difficult to control your thoughts. It is when you are tired that you often speak without thinking, so to speak. Note, for instance, how angry a child becomes after a tiring walk, and how it will speak to you in a manner bordering on rudeness and the impertinence. Just as you should never work a muscle to the point of exhaustion, so should you never study to the point of exhaustion. If you do, you will note how your thoughts will all be poisoned by the toxic element in your blood induced by the fatigue. You will be inclined to vote the study a bore. You will wonder why you took it up. You will think a mastery of it impossible. All mental and physical work pursued to the point of fatigue interferes with your thought control. You must see to it that you never study for long periods unless you have trained yourself to study by carefully graduated periods. For here the law of habit shows up with good effect. When you form habits of study within your strength, you diminish the tendency to fatigue. And consequently, you can have perfect control over your thoughts. Whether your interest in a study is keen, and the habit of study is a gradual growth, uh, where your interest in a study is keen, your interest in a study is keen, and the habit of study is a gradual growth. You can study for a long time without any symptoms of fatigue. Students are warned when doing mental work, which is strange to them, for instance, a new study, to approach it very gradually. Now, this doesn't just apply to students. Okay, I mean, or we can, unless we expand our, our idea of, of studenthood to, let's say, being a student of thought control, student of life. If you can spare an hour to the study, divide it or quarter it rather than give the whole hour to it right away, for nothing is more exhausting than mental work to which we are unaccustomed. The brain is rapidly tired and thought control then is well nigh impossible. How about emotional and sensational factors that hinder thought control? Emotional and sensational sensory factors that hinder thought control. 
it's characteristic of emotions and sensations to extend beyond the particular part of the brain affected by them to other parts. It is owing to this fact that the emotional and sensational worlds have such an important bearing on thought control. So here, we'll just touch on several factors related to the emotional and sensational worlds that hinder thought control. Let's first talk about fear. For it is by far the most important. Then we can talk about worry, excitement, expectation, self-consciousness, accidents, mistakes, errors, and adverse criticism. What were they again? All of them? Excuse me. Fear. What next? Worry. Excitement. Expectation. Self-consciousness. Accidents. Mistakes. Errors and adverse criticism. Fear. Fear tends to suppress all mental activity other than that which the exciting object calls forth. In every emotion the blood rushes to the head. This is very pronounced when fear is aroused. The heart works at treble pressure the breathing becomes labored, the throat becomes dry. The voice sometimes finds utterance in cries, shrieks, or screams. At other times, speech or utterance of any kind is impossible. And by the way, <clears throat> I have sometimes talked about the use of will to control our thoughts, emotions, and actions. Thoughts having to do with our mental energy, okay. mental plane or mental body energy. Actions, I'm referring to physical, uh, use of will to control our physically manifesting energy, physical body, physical plane manifesting energy. And emotional, use of will to control our emotions, stands between the two the mental and the physical. Why is it in between? Well, because it's a combination of both. This is why, this is one way to talk about why it has seemed difficult to, let's say, psychologists to get at emotions with people, with people, to help people with their emotions, their emotional control. There are behavioral, <clears throat> excuse me, behavioral approaches, those deal with actions. Excuse me again. <clears throat> My word. <clears throat> Did I get it? Sounds like it. And then there are cognitive approaches, those dealing with our thoughts. There are problems with both approaches. I have given you at least two techniques here in this playlist, Personal Evolution Part 3, that work pretty good. It's kind of correct to say that they get right at the emotions, not really totally from the behavioral level, and not totally from a, a cognitive level or approaches. It's kind of correct to say that they deal with emotions emotionally. <clears throat> and they are emotional controls that, that <clears throat> implement emotional control to control emotions rather than behavioral control to control emotions or cognitive control. However, there are elements of, of behavioral and cog cognitive um, approach involved with both. But 
the calm attention techniques for the development of the mood of calm confidence being one, and the heart mood. This is a very powerful tool. And is based in cardio neurology, at least. I talked about just a moment ago, I brought up the subject of control over thoughts, control over emotions, and control over physical actions. The emotions standing in between the two, being kind of like a combination of, of the two others, the mental and the physical, right? And this is true. So, one last point about that. If thoughts have to do with the mental body, and actions have to do with the physical body. And emotions, our emotional life, our everyday emotional life, stands between the two. Then what body or plane are we referring to then? the astral. The astral. The body under the influence of fear trembles, shudders, and sometimes is incapable of movement. The eyes see strange sights. They see what the imagination bids them to see. It will be apparent to you from the above that fear must color our thoughts enormously. How then can we control fear and so control the thoughts which it arouses? The first thing to be done is to control the feelings to which fear gives rise. Now, all feelings, whether pleasurable or painful, tend to increase in intensity when we attend to them. Doctors know this. Many of the medicines they give us are simply means to withdraw our attention from the affected part to some other part, so that nature may be left undisturbed to deal with the seat of the disease. To control your feelings, then, you must neglect them. That is, give them little attention. <clears throat> Now, this does not mean going into psychological denial or hiding from our feelings. <clears throat> I'm going to just add in here, due attention to them is important. Due attention. Giving th something is due attention. Usually, if we actually have some level of control over our attention such that we are able to give something attention, true attention, then quite often the thing requires a less duration of attention than we may think. If we don't give something as due attention though, and we don't have control over our attention to any great extent, then due attention may be lingering in the background waiting to be given for a long period of time. And then we get into this repression thing, and this denial thing, this, this, this unhealthy ignoring of something, because it hasn't yet been given its due attention. Exercise and training in this has been underway with you if you have been following the course of training provided here in this playlist, Personal Evolution Part 3. It's already been laid out, mapped out, to a good extent for you. So if you give an affair is due attention, and you do it properly, you actually give it attention, so that you are aware of the situation. Then when that due attention is done, 
It's done. Further attention is undue. And will only eat up your energy. Far better to place your attention on what there is to be done. And on what you are doing. Than to continue placing attention on something once due attention has already been given it. So, when we say here, to control your feelings then, you must neglect them. That is, give them little attention. This means, all right, how long does it take to give a feeling its due attention? If you're giving things their attention, truly, what? A flash, an instant, to recognize the thing. Truly recognize it. Acknowledge it. What else does it need? In many cases, nothing more than that. <clears throat> well, in order to know the answer to that question, what does what's required here oh, with regard to a feeling? It must be given its due attention. And in most cases, it's going to be totally appropriate then to go on and give it little attention. What else does it need? You must think of anything but fear thoughts. If the fear feeling comes up, that's the one being talked about here in particular. In other words, you must cultivate inhibition by substitution. In other words, you must cultivate inhibition by substitution. This is the name given by us here to what we understand when, when we control one thought by its opposite or its contrary thought. That's polarization of thoughts. You Applying the principle of polarity, which is a principle inherent in the law of opposites. And we then apply the mental aspect of the law of attraction by focusing or polarizing our thinking and focusing on it, drawing our feeling, let's say, toward an opposite pole from the one that we, we, we want to move away from. <clears throat> This is the name given by us here uh, to what we understand when we control one thought by its opposite or contrary thought. Inhibition by substitution. The opposite. But how must we proceed to control fear when the exciting object is not a mere idea but is actually present before us? It is evident that something else is necessary beyond merely controlling our feelings, then. The first thing to do is to arouse the instinct of self-assertion. When this instinct is aroused, it induces you to act. Summon the instinct of self-assertion. You already know and are probably becoming quite masterful with summoning at least one thing, the mood of calm confidence. Because you have done extensive work in creating it in the first place and extensive work by now through your work in this playlist, Personal Evolution Part 3, in summoning it and implementing that summoning into the rigors of your everyday life. So you know what it is to summon something, and you know how this all works. You know how this works. You know that the mood of calm confidence, what we defined, the, the building blocks of the mood of calm confidence, were things that already existed within your own human constitution in the first place.
Well, in like manner, so is the instinct of self-assertion. How must we proceed to control fear when the exciting object is not a mere idea, but is actually present before us? It is evident that something else is necessary beyond merely controlling our feelings. The first thing to do is to arouse, summon, the instinct of self-assertion. When this instinct is aroused, summoned, it induces you to act. You must also think of brave deeds or bravery in any form, and you must refuse to listen to the fear thoughts. If you know the fear thoughts are there, then perhaps you have given them their due attention already. Every student of thought control should recognize that fear is useless. Don't get fooled into believing that there is healthy fear. It is simply a drag upon the energy. Upon energy. Period. Energy. And if it is encouraged, it is bound to make us weaklings. In my youthful days, I used to wonder how I should get through tomorrow the work of a busy day. On one memorable day, the thought came to me, you have always got through so far. <laughs> Chances are you'll get through again. And since that memorable day, tomorrow's, have lost their terrors for me. I asked you to put on paper. Here's what to do. Put on paper the things that you that, that have worried you and are perhaps still worrying you. Find a piece of paper. I'll give you a moment. I don't mean to write down all your worries not right now while I wait. I mean make a note that you're going to do this. Find a piece of paper. Get something to write with. Go ahead. Okay. If you need to pause the video, go ahead. I've waited for a moment here. Maybe you have a piece of paper and something to write with right now. Make a note. Make a note. Here's what to do. Put on paper. Make this note. Just write this. Put on paper the things that have worried me and perhaps are still worrying me. Go ahead. Write that down. And then continue to write this. Put alongside the items the numbers of times the worrying thing has come to pass. Write that down. This is part of your note about what you're going to do later on when you have time to give it its attention. I mean, don't try to fill in your list and so forth, you know, the things that you're making a note about doing here while you're listening to this video. Just make your note. Put on paper the things that have worried me and are still worrying me and then put alongside those items the number of times the worrying things have come to have, have happened. There. That's your note. And you're going to do that later. When you can give it its attention. Give it its due attention, right? An old man who was dying, said to his son, My son, I have worried all my life. And nine-tenths of the things I worried about never happened. It's the same with most other people. The mass of things we worry about never really come to anything. Next time you're inclined to worry about anything, 
Look at it in this light. It is long against it is long odds against the thing you worry about coming to pass. Think about that. It's long odds against the thing you worry about coming to pass. I mean, the thing we're worrying about is just one possibility among many. You know, the outcome is one possibility among many. <clears throat> Take the sporting chance and don't worry. It takes practice. It does take practice. We're talking about thought control here, remember? It takes practice. It takes perseverance. And we have tools under our belt right now through the previous work here in this playlist, Personal Evolution Part 3, to, to, to put this into place. Everything that's working together for you here from this playlist can all be applied to this. I mean, it all applies to all each part of this, the, the, this training in this playlist, Personal Evolution Part 3, applies to all the other parts. <clears throat> and there will be much more. I'm giving you a lot of cognitive information right here at, at this area in the playlist to let you get caught up on, on a lot of the to-do stuff. But even in this cognitive information, there are hidden to-dos. <clears throat> Next time you're inclined to worry about anything, look at it in this light. It is long odds against the thing you worry about ever coming to pass. Take the sporting chance and don't worry. If the worrying thing were a racehorse, you would get tired of betting upon its chance for you would lose too much money. It wins a very small proportion of the millions of races it enters. <coughs> Good grief. Excuse me again. It wins a very small proportion of the millions of races it enters. Millions of races. Therefore, once more remember, the odds are long against the worrying thing coming to pass, so do not worry. Just don't worry. How do you do that? Remember, inhibition by substitution. Inhibition by substitution. Inhibition by substitution. You will say, <clears throat> goodness, you will say perhaps, oh yeah, the above is all right in minor cases, but what about the crises of life? Huh? Well, even then, what good does worry do for you? <clears throat> what good does the worry habit do for you? Not much more good than the hurry habit. And just a bit ago, we talked about doing things quickly. Didn't say doing things in a hurry. <clears throat> we, talked, we, talked, we were talking about efficiency. Not hurrying. Not the hurry habit. <clears throat> Here we're talking about, now we're talking about the worry habit. Remember, worry is a species of mental inflammation. It spreads over the entire brain until it paralyzes initiative and effort. Now, if a crisis is in front of you, is this the state of mind that's going to help you deal with it? Rhetorical question. The answer is no. If you were to deal successfully with a crisis, you must control the worry mode. The worry mood. What would be a good mood, let's say, 
to substitute for the worry mood? What do you think? Are there any that you know of that you have a good deal of experience with by now due to your work here in this playlist, Personal Evolution Part 3? Hmm? Something that is the result of the calm attention technique? What was that called? The mood of calm confidence? Perhaps? We gave very detailed instruction in how to do that. And part of that detailed instruction was to do it every day as a standalone exercise, and then when the right time comes, as an exercise in implementing it into your everyday life, and then when the right time comes, <clears throat> in accordance with the instructions given, right? actually summoning it when it's needed increasingly through the day until it becomes a habit. By this time in the playlist, now, that habituation is well underway for you. If you were to deal successfully with a crisis, now here we are talking about crises. Isn't it time in the playlist for the mood of calm confidence to be so habituated by you and for you to be so good at it that now the situations for your actual implementation into the rigors of everyday life should be suitable for, uh, for actual crises? Remember, building up slowly, 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 more and more critical events throughout the day. You know, it wasn't the kind of thing you were going to be able to do instantly with difficult affairs in life. No. These things have to be built up to slowly, but with regular practice. Increasing the difficulty of the circumstances. Uh, in which you summon the mood of calm confidence, remember? Well, now we're talking about crises. And now, if you've been following through with the material in this playlist, Personal Evolution Part 3, you are probably ready to, or at the point where you can effectively summon the mood of calm confidence in critical situations. Instead of being controlled by the worry mood. There's only one way in which to do this, and that is to seek a change of thought. Refuse to brood over, over the worrying thing. And I'm suggesting Inhibition by substitution with the mood of calm confidence. <clears throat> now, you're not going to be able to prevent the worrying thing from entering your consciousness. It's at that moment when you've given it its due attention, its recognition, when you have recognized it, that you summon the mood of calm confidence habituated significantly this mood of calm confidence may act automatically and I did tell you, I did point that out in the instruction way back earlier in this playlist that, that, that there may come a time when that happens when it just becomes a, uh, an automatic response to affairs but at the same time you're still going to have awareness of what's going on. Because your awareness of your mental states, of your subtle energy changes, will also be increasing. So this automatic response doesn't mean you don't notice it happening anymore. 
No, because your awareness is also increasing, improving. More and more subtle levels of mental energy and emotional energy are being recognized by you. And your control is deepening. You're becoming broader and deeper. <clears throat> the habituation, as well as the increase in awareness, happen in parallel if you're going about these things correctly, as given. To be done here. Yeah, you're not going to be able to prevent these affairs from coming into consciousness, but you can prevent them from, from forming trains of thought. If you have practiced faithfully the exercises given here, you will know that this is possible. Now, what about excitement? Remember, we were going to talk about that. Excitement is a valuable stimulus. It's also a great deterrent. A speaker who feels the stimulus of excitement arouses the emotions and passions of his audience. Let him lose control over his excitement, and he becomes incoherent and extravagant. And his audience has nothing but contempt for him. Now, I see that this video has, is approaching 1 minute 17, uh, 1 hour 17 minutes. So I'm going to cut it off. And we'll get on with excitement, adverse criticism, and so forth in the immediately following video. Under the general topic here, in the general topic, thought control. See you in the next video. Be well.